Amen. We we'll pray the Lord will make us partakers of that in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your children who are here tonight. We thank you for the joy we have when we come to the table of the Lord like this, to partake of the bread of life, to study your word, and to be strengthened for our journey. Lord, we are praying that all of us who are here tonight, none will come in vain in Jesus' name. We pray for our brothers, our sisters, our members of the choir, the workers, socials, everybody. And for the invitees as well. We pray, O oh Lord, you enrich our lives for the study of the word tonight in Jesus' name. Our prayer is, none will miss the final reward in Jesus' name. We know that studying the word is like the backbone of the Christian and the backbone of the church. And we pray that nothing will damage this backbone, this Bible study, in Jesus' name. Strengthen all your people. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are so very happy you are here tonight. And we thank the Lord for making you understand that the Bible study is very important for your Christian life, for your Christian journey. We are in the epistle of James. We're now in the last chapter, and we're soon about to finish the book. But we have some very important uh, studies and lessons before we actually finish the book. Today we're looking at chapter 5, verses 7 through to 11. You will notice, if you were here last week, that the first verses of chapter 5, six of them, verses 1 to 6, they deal with the... A wickedness of wealthy people in oppressing the poor and defrauding the poor. And such oppression and cheating obviously brought trials in the lives of the believers at that time, just like it does today. And so the believers were expecting that a change will come, either that the Lord will quickly take away their difficulties, or if not, the Lord will return immediately so that all the trials, all the difficulties will come to an end. Isn't that what we feel? Isn't that how we expect whenever we face difficulties or there are disappointments in life or we face danger or disaster? It seems like a single day is longer than usual. It seems like a week is stretching out to be like a month. And when we're under persecution like that, under oppression like that, we are tempted to be very, very impatient. That's why the passage we are talking about today is telling us about the triumph of patience in all circumstances. Look at it in James chapter 5. Actually, we're looking at verses 7 through to 11. You have five verses there, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And in those five verses, you have patient or patience mentioned five times. It, it must be very important then, if in five verses, the mention of patience is five times. Look at it. You may want to count silently while we're reading. In verse 7, be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the horseman man, that's the farmer, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. Grudge not one against another brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That means the outcome of the dealing of the Lord, the result of the end of the dealing of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Here we have uh, the teaching telling us that we need to be patient. You will notice in verse 7 it says, Be patient therefore. The word therefore refers back to verses 1 through to 6. It's addressing the brethren who are being oppressed, the brethren who are being defrauded, 
the brethren who are being persecuted and their rights have been denied them. Injustice in the world in which they were living, just like it's happening in the world in which we are living today. But we must realize that because of the present condition, the world being under Satan's rule, there are troubles and there are trials. And those troubles and trials of life, they are part of life. In fact, the Lord tells us we must expect it. It is part of the present dispensation, part of the present life in which we're living. You have that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at Job chapter 5 verse 7. Job 5 verse 7. It says, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. It says, it's like uh, there is an unchanging law in the world. As a spark will fly upward when you strike two stones or two pieces of iron together. And it's always like that. It says, so you will find man is born unto trouble. It says there's trouble in the world and you are in that kind of world. Therefore, you don't expect that you will go through the world without some trial, without some trouble, without some persecution, without some problems. But take heart and be patient in it because the Lord is on the side of the people of God. In First Peter chapter 5, First Peter chapter 5, verse 9. It says, whom resisted fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. Uh, Peter here is addressing believers who might be so impatient with their trouble, impatient with their problems. And they will say, maybe it's even better for me to go in back into the world. Because if I were in the world, maybe there will be no trouble. Maybe there will be no problem. Then it says, you resist this devil steadfastly in the faith. Don't you know he said, the same afflictions are accomplished in your relatives, your relations, your brethren, your brothers and sisters, blood relations that are in the world. That you are in the church and you are having some trouble. You should even thank God that you are in the Lord. Because uh, those who are in the world, they have their trouble and there is nobody to dry their tears. There is nobody to comfort them. There is nobody to support them. There is nobody to sustain them. But for those of us who are in the Lord, we are not suffering in vain. The Lord is on our side and he will see us through in Jesus' name. In John chapter 16 verse 33. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. That's the nature of the world. That's the condition of the world. The world is under the dominion of the devil. Therefore, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But then, Paul tells us that what we're going through really is nothing at all when compared with the reward we're going to have in eternity. That's why it says in Second King, Second Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There is purpose for everything that you go through as a child of God here on earth. Therefore, the counsel of the word of God to you is that you allow that thing to do its perfect work and you'll be patient so that patience will be a fruit in your life. As we look at what we're studying today, we're looking at it under three subtitles. Number one, patience while waiting for Christ's coming. Number two, peace while not complaining of our cross. Then number three is perseverance during crises and conflicts. We come to number one. Number one is patience while we're waiting for Christ's coming. We come back to James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the horseman man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and has long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. 
you will see here that uh, those two verses mentioned, being patient. It gives us as a command. It says, be patient. And then it tells us, it's talking to the people that enjoy the grace of God. And we have all the reason on earth to be patient. The Lord is on our side. His grace is sufficient for us. Others have gone before us. And many people have suffered much more than we are suffering. And then the Lord has said, He moderates everything. There is nothing that comes to you that will go beyond your strength because He cares for you. He says, therefore, with all that supporting you, you are a brother, you are a sister. Be patient. Then he tells us another reason. It says, unto the coming of the Lord. He gives us a reason for us to cheer up. A reason for us to endure. He says, because it will not be forever. The Lord will come, and at the coming of the Lord, everything will come to an end. Then the question might be in the hearts of those people. As the question may be in your heart, but why has he not come? Why you see, we're just hearing, he will come, he will come, and he has not come. He said, behold, the farmer, the husband man, he waits for the precious fruit of the earth. He said, the Lord is waiting, because he has other sheep that are not of this fold yet, and them he must bring. And there will be one fold and one shepherd. He doesn't want the people that need to be saved, he doesn't want them to be lost. Therefore, he's waiting. For the fruit of our evangelism. For the fruit of his death on the cross. He's waiting for that precious fruit. Because every soul is precious in his sight. And then he has long patience. That's talking about the farmer. And that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord has been patient. And he's been waiting patiently. Until we receive. That is until the farm. For the farmer will receive the early and the latter rain. He says, be ye also patient. The farmer is patient. The Lord Jesus Christ is waiting patiently before he comes back. You are now the one to be patient. Be ye also patient. Establish your heart. Be firm in your conviction. For the coming of the Lord draws near. He still concludes that section by telling us the Lord is coming. He's telling us to be patient. He knows our problem. And he knows our tendency. And that's the tendency of everybody that is suffering. Most of us are eager that all our trials, all our problems be over in a moment. We tend to be impatient with situations and circumstances that test and try our patience. It's the same with young people. It's the same with older people. If uh, we are young students, teenagers, and we're living in some circumstances, not enough food at home, and there are trials at home, problems at home, or it may be we're living with a guardian, then we feel that this is too much. I want to grow up very quickly and come out of authority so that nobody will be controlling me. Then I'll do what I like, go where I want. We are impatient. And then when we become older to you, when we get married, we're, patient, we're impatient. If there is any trouble, the in-laws are pulling us, and the husband or the wife is not making life easy, we have the tendency to be impatient. If we are working in a particular place, and they are unjust there, they are not giving us a right, again, we are impatient. We want that thing that belongs to us, our right. We want it now, now, very quickly, in all trials of life, we find that God's grace is sufficient for us. If we lean upon the Lord, if we depend upon the Lord, you'll find that in those situations, everything eventually will be all right. And by His grace, we can remain patient, no matter how severe or relentless our problems or persecutors may be. That's why you find all through the Scriptures, we are counseled, we are commanded, we are exhorted, we are enjoined, that we ought to be patient. In Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. And you are happy that you are not the only one. Paul in his own time, he wrote to the Thessalonian believers. He said, you are troubled, yes we know that. We are not ignorant of the fact 
that believers go through some troubles, tribulations, and trials and difficulties here. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Do you see, as James was counseling the people, commanding the people to be patient while they were looking for the coming of the Lord. Here Paul is doing the same thing. He's telling us, you rest. He's telling us, you'll be patient. He's telling us, don't be in a hurry. The Lord will come, and definitely he will come. Then he tells us in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The temptation is to take vengeance for yourself, to revenge, and to say, this is too much. I'm going to show them, I too, I can strike back. But the Lord says, vengeance is mine. Leave that in the hands of the Lord. When the Lord comes, he will bring vengeance upon the people that have not repented. In verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. The saints are the believers. The believers are those who are saved. Those who are saved are the people that have repented of their sins. They have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they have the witness in their spirit. They are children of God. And then it says, when Christ comes, if you endure to the end, he will be glorified in you. And to be admired in all them that believe because a testimony among you was believed in that day. In Romans chapter 8, still reminding us that we need to be patient. If you are going through trouble, look around you. All these thousands of people or hundreds of people see around you, they have their troubles too. And God is helping them to be patient. And God is helping them to keep on reading the Bible, praying to the Lord, loving the Lord, fellowship with the people of God. If God is helping all these people around you, the same Lord can give you the same help. And you can be patient in your trials, tribulations, and troubles. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time and not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall uh, be revealed in us. Again, you will see here he's talking about suffering in the present time. And then he's talking about the glory that shall be revealed when the Lord will come. It's always telling us that we Christians, we don't suffer in vain. We Christians, if we suffer now, there is glory that is going to be revealed at the coming of the Lord. And because you are looking forward, and you know the Lord is coming, therefore you are at rest. Therefore you are not in trouble at all. You know when the Lord comes, glory will be revealed. You will wear a crown of glory. Because of that, you are patient now. Because of that, you are enduring now. In verse 24 and verse 25 of Romans chapter 8, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, what does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it, the hope of his coming. We know that when he comes, there will be no more tears, there will be no more pain, there will be no more sickness, there will be no more suffering, and that's our hope. And because we are patiently waiting for that, we know that when he appears, it will be to your joy, it will be to your glory. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For we, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He's telling us, for which cause we faint not. Because we know the Lord is coming. And every little thing we suffer for His glory, however minute, however small, is going to reward us for it when He comes. Because of that, we are not discouraged. Because of that, we are not fainting. Because of that, we are not looking back. It says, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. It's telling us that not having enough food to eat, not having enough money to spend, and therefore you are not able to care for your body as you are to care for your body, and the outward man, the flesh, the body, is uh, going down. That doesn't mean that your spirit also will be going down, that your prayer life will be going 
going down. That your spiritual strength will be going down. It says that your outward man may be perishing, may not have enough, but the inward man, your spirit, your heart, will be renewed day by day. That's when it now says in verse 17, after all, because our light affliction. And Paul was counting himself as part of the people that had the light affliction. If Paul called his own affliction light, what are we going to call your own affliction? Because he was stoned a number of times. He was beaten with many stripes. And when he was stoned, he was left dead. And he was taken to the prison. And it was a bad situation in that prison. And you know, you know the things that he went through. And yet he summarized everything. He put everything together. And he said, our light affliction. Cheer up. Then, if Paul called his imprisonment light affliction, the stoning light affliction, the beating light affliction, not having enough light affliction, joining soften light affliction, and the cold and the nakedness light affliction. You've not got even a fraction of that. You must rejoice in the Lord that the Lord has even protected you and preserved you and moderated your problem. You join Paul and say, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they, will be, they are passing away, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You will see that every time, as you are called to patience in the scriptures, you are also reminded of the nearness of the return of the Lord. The reason for patience is hinged on the nearness on your outline look at that in point one paragraph two that word should be nearness on the nearness of the return of our lord that is the second coming of the lord that's why james links a boat together we should be patient why are we patient because we're waiting for the coming of the lord we're expecting the coming of the lord we're hoping for the coming of the lord james chapter five look at verse seven be patient therefore brethren unto the coming coming of the Lord. As he talks about patience, and then he calls us to patience, he refers to the coming of the Lord. In verse 8, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. The coming of the Lord draweth near. I pray none of us will give up in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. It's telling us about the sufferings of the believers at that time. That you and I will know that many of the things we are going through today that we are calling suffering, if it happened to them in days gone by in the early church, they wouldn't even think or know that they were suffering at all. It says in First Peter chapter 1 verse 6, wherein he greatly rejoiced. Dove now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, trials, for the, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than, the, than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see how it brings in the coming of the Lord again at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith. They may abuse you. They may insult you. They may even beat you. They may do some things that are very inconvenient for you. Inconvenient for the flesh. But cheer up. Understand. Other believers that are in heaven now, they have gone through much more difficult things than you are going through. And because of that, you'll take heart and you'll be patient in chapter 4 verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. The end of all things, all those trials will come to an end very, very soon. All those difficulties will come to an end very, very soon. But the end of all things is certain. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Because the Lord is coming and because everything will soon come to an end, you can afford to be patient. Now many people will say, but how long will it take? Because they, we have been hearing that the Lord will come. The Lord will come. All these years, he has not come. Let me remind you that the prophecy, the first prophecy of Christ's first coming was given in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. 
Do you know that it took 4,000 years before that prophecy actually became fulfilled and eventually Christ came and he was born in, in uh, Bethlehem. But eventually, uh, you understand, even though it appears long, eventually he came. It's the same thing with the second coming of Christ. We know that the truth about the second coming of Christ is all over the scriptures. And we're sure that he will come. Only 2,000 years have passed because the Lord is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And even though he's waiting, he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. And I pray that when he comes, he'll find you in the faith in Jesus' name. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He will come. And when he comes, I pray he'll find you in the faith. Now we go to point number two. And as we look at point number two, we're looking at peace while not complaining of our cross. Understand? Everybody has a little cross to carry. Everybody has a little thing, a little body in to bear. Everybody has a little trial that is going through. Other people are going through it. And a songwriter tells us, carry your cross and take your cross. Bear it with a smile. You can still smile. You can still rejoice. And you can still have peace among yourselves. Even though there are some little, little difficulties around. In James chapter 5 verse 9. James chapter 5, verse 9. Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. I want to tell you that he's still following the same thing. He's talking to the brethren. Some of them were still being oppressed. And they were being defrauded. And they were being cheated. But you understand that they were not suffering the same thing. The brethren were undergoing different kinds of trials. And they were carrying different sizes and weights of crosses. Some suffered more. Some suffered less. And some were severely oppressed. While some others were only slightly afflicted. Some were very, very poor. Others were not so very poor. Those who had heavy crosses to carry, they might be grudging or complaining against the other people that uh, were not carrying too much of a heavy cross. And then they might be saying, you don't understand my situation. It's because uh, you are not going through what I'm going through. That's why you are so joyful. That's why you are so happy. And that's why it appears that everything is going on well for you. And the other fellow said, uh, I'm also going through something. It's only that my own is not like your own, not as visible as your own. And therefore he was telling them, whatever differences appear in the things you are enduring, in the things you are bearing, grudge not one against the other. Complain not against one another. And do not murmur. Don't murmur against the Lord. And don't murmur against one another. Maintain peace among yourselves. Whatever cross you may be bearing. Whatever cross you may be carrying. You see it says. And it's a word of command. Grudge not one against the other. Brethren. He's talking to brethren. Because he knows that that's our tendency. And we grudge one another, we complain against one another, and we murmur against one another for different, different reasons. And it says, don't do that. Because once we begin to grudge, malice will eventually come, envy will be there, jealousy will be there, and then not caring for one another will be there. If you are grudging for somebody, you can't totally care for him and love him the way you ought to. That's why it says, grudge not one another against one another, brethren. In Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. It tells us the cure for, bre uh, for bearing uh, grudges. It says, if you want grudges to be totally away from your mind, murmuring, complaining to be totally away from your mind, there is only one solution, there is only one cure, love one another. You think the other fellow doesn't have trouble, and you have all the trouble on earth, love him. You think the other fellow is not uh, bearing any load, is not bearing any responsibility, and you are bearing responsibility too much for you. 
love him all the same. When we love one another, we are kind to one another, we are tender hearted to one another. That love will cover a multitude of sins and falls. You will not say it's so lively and it's so joyful because he doesn't know anything at all. Uh, never mind, uh, because after he got married, he's got so many children. I'm still looking up to the Lord. That's why he appears happy. He thinks that he's more spiritual than I am. And therefore, you are bearing grudge against him, against her. In your mind, grudge not one another. In that verse 18, it says, And thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. You will not uh, revenge. You will not retaliate. If anybody has done anything to you, you will match it to what they did to Jesus Christ on the cross. And while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Anytime you feel offended, anytime you feel the tendency is there, the temptation is there, that you will bear growth, that you will murmur and complain against your brother, against your sister, either because of what they have done or because of what you are carrying, and you feel that they are contributing to my problem. They are contributing to the load and bearing. Compare what you are going through with what Jesus went through on the cross. And it is only when what you are going through goes beyond, is heavier, is greater than what Jesus Christ has gone through, that you will have an excuse to not forgive and to not love. I don't think you'll ever find a situation where you'll be bearing something greater than what Jesus Christ has gone through. Therefore, your attitude will be, I'll not bear grudge. I'll not hold malice. I will not have any hatred. I'll not have anything in my heart against anybody. Forgive them, Lord. They do not understand how it's hurting me. They do not understand what they are doing. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What the word of God is saying here is that maybe you are a young convert and you are saying hey, they read too many passages of scripture. Uh, do this to your neighbor. Do that good thing to your neighbor. Do that good thing to your neighbor. And I forget everything. Then the word of God is telling us if you forget your responsibility because you're sick, there are too many. It is all encompassed in one thing. Love your neighbor as thyself. If you forget all the details, if you forget all the explanations were given, just make up your mind I will love. When you love uh, then you have fulfilled all the law. A person that loves, what will he do? He'll be a person that is bearing another's body. Therefore you see another person bearing a body greater than your body. You love him and as you love him, you bear the body along with him. A person that loves, he will care for another fellow. You will not think about yourself. You'll think about the other problems. You know the attitude of some people. When all my problems are solved, I'll be able to care for other people. When all my tears are dried up, I'll be able to care for other people. My brother, you will never care for anybody then. Because troubles will never be over. When one trouble is over, another one will come. But you should be praising God that your problem is limited to what it is and it is not greater than what we see. And therefore you say, trouble or no trouble, problem or no problem, I will care for my brother, I will care for my sister. When you are loving one another, we'll be patient with one another. When you, when you really think about it, you have some faults, we all have some faults, and God is patient with us. If God can be patient with us, with all our faults and with all the things we have done in the past, maybe the things we are even still doing now that God is not happy with, but He's patient with us. If God is patient with us, how we ought to be patient with other people too. When you love, you will overlook other people's faults. You will forgive one another. You will be merciful to one another. You will not grudge one another. You will not complain about against other people. You know, some of us, it's like our lives are filled with complaint. Hey, you're unhappy about that, brother. You're unhappy about sister A. You're happy about brother, unhappy about brother B. It's like everybody is offending you every time. But it says, we will not complain against one another. When we're filled with the love of God, we'll be tender-hearted one to another. We'll be watchful so that we do not deliberately offend our fellow brother, our fellow sister. Come back to that, uh, Galatians chapter 5. But if ye bite and devour one another, we take heed that ye be not condemned one of another. Ye be not consumed one of another. It's saying that we're not in the animal kingdom. 
where dogs will bite and bark at dogs, where lions will roar at elephants, and where the bear will roar at the, at the other one, we were children of God. And in the midst of the people of God, there should be no biting, there should be no fighting, there should be no devouring, there should be no, nobody should say that, well, he's not feeling convenient in the church because of my presence or because of what I'm doing against him. We should all feel convenient that we are members of the family of God. That will take love and there will be peace among us. In verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another, envying one another. Uh, do not tease other people. Do not provoke other people. Do not do things that will make them uh, lose their Christian experiences in First Peter. First Peter chapter 4. In First Peter chapter 4, reading there again from verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Uh, the crosses that are heavy, the yokes that are heavy, the problems that are heavy, the things we're going through, everything will soon come to an end. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Above all things have perfect charity, not ordinary charity. Not lukewarm charity, not just charity, love, so so, and not just charity that nobody can feel. Yes, I have charity, I have love, only you may not see it. I have, I love everybody, God knows my heart, only you may not see it. I don't want to pretend, I don't want to be fanatical about my love. It says, Be fanatical about your love, have fervent charity one to another among yourselves, for charity shall cover multitude of sins. How do you know you really have charity? How do you know you really have love? When you are not grumbling, when you are not complaining, when, of course, people will still do things that you may not appreciate. People may do things that you do not like because they are not thinking the way you are thinking. They are thinking in another direction and their, their level of maturity may be different from your own level of maturity. Therefore, they will do things you may not appreciate. How will you know that you have love towards them? When your love is able to cover the multitude of faults and mistakes they are committing in, um, in uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 reading verse 50. Mark chapter 9 verse 50 salt is good but if the salt have lost its saltness and uh, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves have peace one with another. What, what the Lord is telling us here is uh, about love. And uh, the love is the salt that is being referred to here. If we're going to have peace among ourselves, there will be love. But if love has lost its characteristics, its attributes, its saltiness, how then that shall that love uh, do anything and uh, season anything? What are those characteristics of love? Those attributes of love that it says, have salt among yourselves, within yourself. And do not let your salt lose its saltiness. You come to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It tells us the characteristics and the attributes of this love that we are talking about. It says charity, which means love, sobreth long. How long have you endured your husband? How long have you endured your wife? How long have you endured your neighbor? How long have you endured and suffered from those uh, believers around you? Charity suffers long and is kind. Even though it's suffering, yet it will be kind. That is a characteristic of the love we need to preserve among us. Charity envies not whatever they have and I don't have. Whatever they possess and I don't possess. There will be no envy when there is love. When there is charity, charity vaunteth not itself. It's not popped up. That's the attribute. And if that salt has lost its saltness, where we shall it be salted? It will then be good for nothing. When the Christian has lost this central thing, this essential thing, then that Christian becomes good for nothing. He does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. And thinketh no evil. Take note of that. It's not easily provoked. That means that a lot of things will happen, but you just overlook them. A lot of things will happen. You just love your brother. You love your sister. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. That's love. Believeth all things. So believe your fellow brother and sister. That's love. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. You know, 
when those characteristics are there, then we'll be able to have peace between one another. There will be no grudges, and there will be no revenge, there will be no retaliation, when that kind of love is in the midst of the children of God. So that's what the Lord is calling us to. That's what the Lord is encouraging us that we ought to have. In Philippians uh, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Reading there from verse 14. Philippians 2 verse 14. Still telling us and reminding us the responsibility of the child of God. And how you ought to have a free heart, a, a loving heart, a caring heart, attitude to the brothers and sisters and to the men and women around you. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 14, do all things, not some things, not many things, all things without murmurings and disputings. You're working in the church, in your district church, do it without murmuring and disputing. And you are helping your fellow brother in the house fellowship, do it without murmuring. Or it is that you are helping your wife, helping your neighbors, do it without murmuring and disputing. Anything you are doing, you know it's to help him. If they could help themselves, maybe they would not have needed you. But you know that they need you, that's why you are doing it. It may be difficult, it may be heavy, it may be hard. Don't worry about that. The Lord will give us the needed grace. Do it without murmuring and disputing. That ye may be blameless. That's the reason you are not murmuring. That you may be blameless. That's the reason you are not complaining. That you may be blameless. That's the reason you do it cheerfully. Not caring, not minding what you are going through yourself. So that you will be blameless and harmless sons of God. Without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain. Vain, neither labored in vain. I pray that none of us will labor in vain or run in vain in Jesus' name. In uh, First Corinthians chapter four, First Corinthians chapter four, reading there in verse five. Here is an important verse, and it shows what attitude you ought to have, what attitude everybody ought to have. In First Corinthians chapter four, verse five. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. You know why we are cross with one another? We judge too quickly. You know why we pick offense at every little, little thing? We judge so very quickly. We jump at a conclusion. Something has happened. Maybe it's a bad thing. But you don't know the reason and the source. And uh, the where with that or bad, that bad thing. And we jump to a conclusion. Judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord come. Who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of God. We come back now to James and in James uh, chapter 5. James chapter 5, we look at that verse 9 once again. It says in verse 9, grudge not one against another, brethren, Lest ye be condemned. It says, if we're grudging one another, if we're envying one another, we'll bring ourselves to condemnation. It says, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Grudging against one another, complaining against one another, deliberately offending one another, will bring condemnation in our hearts and condemnation in our lives. And uh, that's the reason he reminds us the judge is standing at the door. The Lord knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He watches and he weighs all our actions. Leave all the judgment to him. He knows all the details that do, we do not know. And it will not be long when he will bring everything to light. That brings us to point number three. Point number three, perseverance during crisis and uh, conflicts. Perseverance during uh, crisis and conflicts. It tells us in verse 10, James chapter 5, verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we, we count them happy. 
which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and ye have seen the end of the Lord. That means the outcome, the result, the end of the dealings of the Lord with him. That the Lord is very pitiful and is of tender mercy. Here the uh, writer is reminding us of the examples of other people. And thank God we are not the only pilgrims that are going on the way to heaven. Other people have walked this same narrow road before. And it says, remember them. They too, they suffered affliction. But they bore everything patiently. And what did they do? It tells us in that verse 10, brethren, the prophets who spoke, who have spoken in the name of the Lord. He says, they spoke in the name of the Lord, but they are speaking in the name of the Lord, doing the will of God, remaining in the center of the will of God. That did not shield them from trouble, because everybody will have a little trouble here in the world. Even Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, he wasn't totally free from all trouble. He still had some of these trials we are talking about. If Jesus went through it, we too will go through it. Now, it talks about all the prophets of the Old Testament. That they too, they had things they went through. And so if we're going through anything, we should take uh, the example as uh, a kind of beacon light for us. And we should comfort ourselves. I am not alone. What I'm going through. Other people have gone through similar things. And in fact, other people have gone through heavier, greater things than this. And if God gave them grace to endure, God will give you grace to endure as well. In Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 15. And the Lord God of their fathers said to them, by, the mes- by his messengers, those are the prophets, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on the people. And then it says, and on, their, on his dwelling place. But... Here is the suffering they went through. Here is the uh, difficulty they went through, the trials they went through. But they mocked the messengers of God. Are they mocking you? Are they abusing you? Are they making a caricature? Uh, trying to, you know, do something and, and make fun of you? It happened to other people. Oh, don't be so sad. Why are they doing like that to me? Why are they insulting me? They abused and they insulted the prophets before you. They mocked the messengers of God and despised his word and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. The, the point is that the people that went before us, they through they overcame some difficulties, they went through some difficulties, and if you are going through the similar things, be, be courageous and uh, take a challenge from what uh, they went through. The Lord that sustained them will sustain every one of us in Jesus' name. We're now looking at Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah chapter 38, we're looking at verse 6. Then took, uh, then took the Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of uh, Malachiah, the son of Amalek, that was in the court of the prison. And they let him down, they let Jeremiah down, what they caused. And the dun- in the dungeon, there was no water at- but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. And that's another example of the people that suffered. They were prophets, they spoke the word of God, they were faithful to the Lord, and they didn't uh, quit their ministry just because they were suffering. They didn't quit what the Lord had called them to do just because they were suffering. Maybe you are a coordinator, maybe you are a women coordinator, or maybe it is that your house fellowship leader or maybe you are doing something for the Lord and while you are doing that thing for the Lord there is suffering there, there is trial there there are problems there, there are difficulties there and because of those difficulties I will not do this thing again and my preaching is getting me into trouble my witnessing is getting me into trouble being in the prayer warrior is getting me into trouble in fact I never got as much trouble before I joined the choir because of all those things I'm going through, what I'm going to do now is to quit, I will not do it again you know what Jeremiah went through? They even dropped him in the dungeon. And he sank deep into the mire. But you know, he was still faithful to the Lord. That's what the Lord is telling us. That because of, uh, you know, the examples of these people that have gone ahead and they persevered and they endured. And they didn't mind what things happened to them. That we too well, will not mind what may be happening to us. Since we know that we're in the center of the will of God in doing the will of 
God. I pray that the courage to endure, the conviction to endure, and the fortitude to endure, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. It says, Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and, say all, and shall say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they, the prophets that were before you. Again, hear Jesus Christ talking to the people that support persecution. And that's what I'm telling you, and that's what the word of God is telling us, that when you are in this world, and you are walking the narrow path, and you are following the way of God, there will be persecution, there will be trouble, there will be problems, but Jesus said, blessed are you, when men shall revile you. What does it mean to revile? It means to make fun of you, it means to ridicule you, it means to abuse you, it means to insult you. Jesus said it will happen. So when it happens, don't mind, and it says when they shall persecute you. Then maybe the persecution may cause pain, it may take some rights away from you, it may make you, it may deny you of some things that belongs to you and then they shall say all manner of evil against you falsely that's what some people cannot endure they say uh, i even understand ordinary persecution i understand when they do this against me i understand when they do that against me but can you imagine the lie they told against me the things i didn't do they said i did it all right if it's like that i'm not going to continue again jesus said you shall be glad when they say those evil things against you and they say it falsely but make sure it's not because of your own sin for my sake then he says in verse 12 rejoice and be exceeding glad you know when it says rejoice that would have been enough but then he added it says and be exceedingly glad why are you glad because you are persecuted why are you glad because you are suffering uh, some problems some pain it says because uh, so they persecuted uh, the prophets that were before you and the only reward is great in heaven and your reward will be great in heaven in jesus name name. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, looking at verses 41 and 42, let's see the attitude of uh, these uh, believers in the early church when they were persecuted, when things uh, happening to us, now similar things happen to them. In Acts chapter 5 verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name shame for his name, abuse for his name. They misuse them, they beat them, and these were adult grown-up men, family men, and they did all those injuries against them, but they were rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They didn't quit their ministry, they didn't quit what they were doing for the Lord, just because of the suffering and daily in verse 42, in the temple, and in every house, they ceased not, they didn't stop, they ceased not to teach and to preach, Jesus Jesus Christ. And that's the same attitude that we ought to have. Come back to James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, it becomes particular. He had mentioned in general when he said in verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. That's generally just says the prophets. And you can fill in the name whether you are thinking of Jeremiah or you are thinking of Amos or you are thinking of Isaiah or you are thinking of Ezekiel or you are thinking of uh, Daniel or you are thinking of other prophets that suffered. And then it says you take them as an example of suffering and fiction and of patience. And it says, behold, we count them happy. We count them blessed. We count them fortunate that endure, that have the grace of God in their lives to endure. Now he becomes particular. And he mentions an individual now in particular and he says, ye have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end result and have seen the dealing of the Lord, the consummation of the old sin, the result of the Lord. The Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Of course, you, you remember the story of Job. But first of all, let me just say that Job was a real man. It's not fiction. It's not uh, something that, uh, you know, they just wrote in the Bible just to tell a story. It's not uh, just uh, something uh, done by a story, a, a storyteller. It's a real thing that happened to a real person. Otherwise, he will not be using it as an example to challenge and encourage the believers who are going through persecution. 
if you have somebody that didn't actually exist and you only write about him in a storybook and it's uh, all fiction, how can you use a fictitious figure uh, to encourage somebody? It must mean that Job actually went through those things. That's why it's using him. Let's come to Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, reading from verse 20. Here he tells us, Then Job arose, and he rent his mantle, and he shaped his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Listen to verse 22 now. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly, and that man went through much much more than you can ever go through. All children gone, dead. All servants but one dead. All cattle, all property gone. Lost everything and yet he did not sin with his mouth. He worshipped the Lord. Can't you continue worshipping the Lord even though trials are there? Even though difficulties are there? Even though problems are there? In Job chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity cause God and die? The wife became fed up. The, the wife had endured the things in chapter 1. Property lost, children lost, a lot of things gone. But the husband now boils all over. And the woman said this is too much. How can we keep on worshipping God and this has happened to us? We cannot bear this anymore. Are you still retaining your integrity? Cause God and die. But he and she said unto her thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil in all days. Job sinned not with his leaves. Come to chapter 13 of Job. Chapter 13 of Job, reading there from verse 15 and verse 16. Here it says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. He didn't know the source of the trouble. He thought it was God. When all those, uh, all those children died, all the property lost and boils all over him, and he was breathing in pain, and it was too much, almost unbearable. He thought it was God doing it. He said, even if it is God, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. I will not backslide because of that. I will not leave the center of the will of God because of that. He also shall be my salvation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. In chapter 23, chapter 23, reading from verse 8, it came to the situation where he prayed about it, about all the problem, but the problems were not solved. But that didn't make him to backslide. Chapter 23 of Job, verse 8, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. You know what Job was talking about? He said, I prayed about my problem. I saw the Lord about my problem. I wanted him to remove this. And he used to answer my prayer. I used to be in fellowship with him. I used to know how to get his attention. But now, to the right, I looked for him. I couldn't find him. I went to the other side. I looked for him. I couldn't find him. On the left hand side, I couldn't fi find him. And yet, he says in verse 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I know it's trial. I know it's tribulation. I know it is what I will go through in the world. But when he has tried me... I shall come forth as gold. And then he says in verse 11, My foot has held its steps. Its way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the word of his mouth more than my necessary food. Quiet time will not stop because I'm suffering. Reading the Bible will not stop because I'm suffering. Coming to Bible study will not stop because I'm suffering. And uh, nothing will stop. I'll keep on serving the Lord, worshipping the Lord, whatever I say. That's what he was saying. And that's a challenge to you and to me. That whatever may be happening, keep on serving the Lord. Keep on serving the Lord. Whatever Satan or the demons or his agents might be doing, keep on serving the Lord. In Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, reading verse 25. 
all through to verse uh, to verse 27 here job said for i know that my redeemer liveth i know troubles are there but my redeemer liveth trials are there but my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and do after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god whom i shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my rays be consumed within me but you know what james is telling us he says we have seen the end of the lord that the lord is merciful and pitiful talking about job we have seen about the end result that the lord was pitiful concerning him that we find in job chapter 42 job chapter 42 verse 10 and the lord turned the captivity of job he will turn your captivity when he prayed for his friends you know he didn't bear any grudge he didn't have malice with anybody he didn't want to revenge against anyone he even prayed for all those people that accused him all through from those uh, many chapters he prayed for them also the lord gave job twice as much as he had before have you lost anything through persecution the lord will give you double have you lost anything because you are taking your stand for christ the lord will give you double in jesus name in verse 11 then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and, and did eat bread with him in his house and they, they, they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil they said that the lord had brought upon him was it the lord that brought it upon him no, it was the devil. And then he said, Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job. The Lord will bless your latter end. More than his falls, for he had 14,000 sheep, and uh, 6,000 uh, camels, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Everything he lost, everything came back. The Lord will bring everything back in Jesus' name. If you will t tell the Lord that whatever is happening, you will not look back. You have laid your hands on the plow, and you are not going to look back in Jesus' name. That whatever the trial, whatever the difficulty, whatever the problem, you are going to endure till the very end. He will bless you in this world and then in the world to come he will wipe away your tears why don't you rise up and tell the lord whatever persecution whatever problem whatever trial whatever difficulty i'm having whatever misunderstanding i'm going to keep on with the lord i will not allow any of those things to hinder me i will not allow any of those things to make me lose my christian life my christian love my christian virtue my christian commitment my christian consecration i will keep on following the lord persecution will be there my brothers and sisters difficulties will be there my brothers and sisters trials will be there my brothers and sisters temptations will be there my brothers and sisters those who went before us the lord saw them through he will see you through he will see you through he says my grace is sufficient for you